Hi guys, it's Adam and welcome to another video. So today we are going to be discussing philosophy and we're going to be talking about kind of atheistic nihilism, atheistic depression, those kind of experiences, those kind of attitudes that we can quite clearly see either within people or in uh, obviously TV shows as I'm going to discuss. Now we could relate sort of this idea, let's say, of atheistic depression to my own conception of the nihilism of normality. But there's only a certain association there because the nihilism of normality also has within it a certain idealism and a discontent for reality. And so we certainly have themes within what I'm going to discuss today on today's video uh, and the nihilism of normality. But there isn't a whole alignment there. It doesn't align fully. Um, and that's mainly, as I say, because of the branch of the nihilism of normality that is very, very constellated around idealism um, and around the possession by ideas and things like that, um, that kind of create a mirage or a, um, what's a better word, a, a, an illusion, let's say, around um, happiness, as if the clinging to idealism within the nihilism of, of normality um, is, is actually a substitute for happiness. Um, and so there is a clear link between atheistic depression and the nihilism of normality. But the two, unfortunately, we can't really say they're synonymous. Um, if we were to do so, it would be not particularly right because the nihilism of normality is slightly more expansive. Although it is something that I've thought about with regards to whether the nihilism of normality is or could be placed within a feeling or an empirical observation that people have already had. And no doubt people understand the feeling of the nihilism of normality, um, but it seems not to be included or collated into one specific conception. Um, and I understand that there is a kind of risk of being a little bit of a neologist when you coin a new conception like that. But I think it's nice because it allows, in a simple phrase, just an ability to understand the feeling and to know we can label it as such. Um, although there is a, a real danger um, from a philosophical perspective, from a scientific perspective, of uh, simply creating conceptions for a hypothetical or theoretical um ease of communication, let's say, because we, we certainly have ideas that can be created and that can be actually placed um, in language and in specific phrases that relate to a specific phenomenon. Um, we can have that and we can think, well, that's a, that's a good thing. But we can also have a, um, a super fluidity to it in the 21st century in which, and I see this a lot in psychology, and I've talked about it before, but there's this um, unnecessary abundance of concepts that are merely sort of just there to conceptualise something in a totally pointless way or... Um, sort of just a, an abundant way, an unnecessarily abundant way, because they, they just don't need to be there. There's so many concepts that just don't need to be there. And yet we pursue this line of thought and this line of neologisms within psychology or within science because it gratifies our own egos, or in, in Jungian terms, it gratifies our own animus. Um, and... Uh, it, it just, to me, it seems absolutely pointless, but um, still, you know, I'm as guilty as it as, as anyone else um, because there's 
such a, uh, uh, an almost cheeky smile uh, like feeling that you get with it when you coin a new phrase or you coin a new term. Um, it's something that can make you feel as if I've m made my mark on the world. I've stamped my uh, mark on the world by coining this new phrase, even if it um, doesn't have necessarily the complete grounding that it needs to. Um, and so I think there is a real risk with coining new phrases and there's philosophers and there's psychologists and there's all manner of different people and scientists who uh, have got into this trap of coining new words or coining new conceptions for the fact that they get addicted to the idea of wanting to find new things and, and end up just naming or label it, labeling everything. Um, even when a label particularly or isn't quite warranted. Um, but yeah, so we're going to talk about this today. We're going to talk about um, atheistic nihilism or atheistic depression. And the TV show I want to call upon is a TV show that I absolutely love. I think it's a brilliant TV show. Um, I think the creators of it are absolutely creative geniuses. Uh, I think it should go down in the history books as being... Uh, brilliant minds, absolutely brilliant first-rate minds, um, and the TV show is Rick and Morty. Now, if you haven't seen it, I'll give you a little bit of a, of a view of it, I suppose, or a, a, an idea, an understanding of it. Now, when I watch TV shows, I don't really get involved too much unless I really, really get obsessed with the show, which... I can see myself doing with Rick and, Morty, uh, Rick and Morty, but I haven't quite got there yet. But I don't really remember characters' names and all that sort of stuff. Obviously, I know Rick's called Rick and Morty's called Morty and you've got Jerry and you've got Beth and Summer. That's it. That's the daughter's name. See, I told you I'm bad. Um, but I don't remember second names, although I do remember Rick, it's Rick Sanchez. So I assume that that's the, the name of the family as well, although Jerry's married to... Beth, so he would have taken a different name. So Morty must be called something else. So yeah, maybe I don't know the last name of Morty. But anyway, so there's this sort of uh, lead protagonist, you would say, called Rick, Rick Sanchez. And he's the typical kind of, well, I say the typical. He's not quite the typical or the stereotypical or the archetypal um, sort of eccentric or slightly mad genius type he's not quite that he has a um, very interesting and very intelligent um, character and obviously the people who wrote the character are very very good with how they've done it with how they've structured it he is essentially a 65 70 year old man but the way in which they've written the character it's almost as if he is a 20-year-old man and a 70-year-old man in one. Very, very interesting. Now, from a Jungian perspective, because I do like to give a Jungian perspective here and there, he is both sides, let's say, to the Animus. Now, the Animus has many, many sides, not just two, but if we're going to be binary about this, let's say... Um, or if we're going to be, um, uh, you know, we're going to have two different elements that we're going to look at, then you would say the immature animus and the mature animus. And the mature animus being rational, philosophical, centered, balanced, um, and of course has a lot of heroicness in them and all the rest of it. Uh, you would say there's that side. You would also say the immature animus, the kind of uh, boldness, the brashness, the overbearingness, the... You see it with a lot of young guys, you know, I don't really need to go into too much depth, you can simply look at any young guys who are very, very spirited and brash and bold and all the rest of it and think we're all that. Um, so there's those two sides to Rick uh, and unfortunately a lot of the time he... he which which actually is the genius of the comedy, in fact. So it's not an unfortunate thing from the from the show's creators' perspective, uh, perspectives. But um, in fact, from the viewers' perspective, you would say uh, 
somewhat. Unfortunately, he often gets into this uh, very, very uh, immature-like animus when he's in dangerous situations. Now, of course, there's a lot of humour in that, but you you also get a little bit on the edge of your seat because you think, oh, God, what's he doing now? Is he, you know, is he going to be able to do this? And we always know, like any... Uh, lead role you know we're going to get through it very very rarely in a tv show does the lead, lead role die or anything like that certainly it's it's more frequent in movies you get quite a few movies where um the the lead can actually sometimes die especially certain zombie movies or certain disaster movies that's that can be quite prominent um but no you, you have that and and um so where the atheistic nihilism or the athe atheistic depression comes into it obviously the show is um very very atheistic in it in its um outlook and and it's no uh secret it's even kind of mentioned in the show to varying degrees um uh, and and there's obviously there's little hints at God or there's little hints at religion and things like that um, done in a certain way, of course, for comedic effect. It's a, it's absolutely brilliant the way it does it. Now um, I absolutely love atheistic depression. You may be thinking, but Adam, you're meant to be spiritual. You're not meant to love atheism. Doesn't that go against you know the kind of ideology you've adopted in life shall we say well i think that's a very very um reductionistic viewpoint and i think it's a very very um outdated viewpoint spiritually or or even within atheism as well um i love atheistic depression or atheistic nihilism as well because and of course, the two conceptions or the two phrases can also kind of be be drawn into one as well in some regard. Um, but I love those those two ideas or that or that one general idea um, because it laughs at existence, and there's a lot of laughter in spirituality. Spirituality is all about laughter. You know, if you can't laugh, you can't be spiritual. And I don't say that in some sort of, oh, you know, pish posh kind of way, you know, oh, well, if you can't laugh, you know, all that, you know, ironic kind of way or whatever you want to say, I don't know, but I'm trying to think of a word, but I can't think of a word. But I'm not trying to say it in a, in a very light way. I'm saying that you really can't be spiritual if, if you don't laugh, you know, you really have to uh, be able to to laugh at existence and laugh at what this is to be uh, in any way aligned with aligned with what it means to be spiritual and and so we have a lot of ideas of absurdism in the shows like specifically like Wick and Morty uh, and absurdism of course is very very aligned with spirituality I've talked about how I personally be believe from what I've read and from the people uh, in the past. And I've, I've, funnily enough, I've just looked over there and I've got archetypes in the collective unconscious on my desk there. So people in the past who I've read as well, particularly Young and, and Watts, and of course, as much uh, at the moment as I've done research in certain traditions, which, forgive me, I am young. I've not been able to do an incredible amount of research at this point in my life, but I certainly have uh, read a fair few books and I've looked into certain different things and I've done a certainly um, a good superficial viewpoint, you would say, or a good superficial look into a ve various different traditions. And of course, even if I were to go a little bit deeper, uh, I would merely end up gaining the same conclusions intellectually as I, as I have now um, because I understand certain experiential and esoteric knowledge from the specific tradition. So although I may not necessarily have an incredible amount of intellectual knowledge on them, um, there's certainly... Um, I understand certain hidden knowledges in, in certain traditions that allow me to understand the in-depth intellectual knowledge in a more kind of intuitive manner. Um, but it certainly seems to me, obviously, that 
Um, if we're going to go for this idea that simply the non-conceptual or the unconceptual is the highest form of knowledge possible and that uh, that is uh, essentially where all knowledge claims meet their end and that uh, no matter what we try and prove in science or no matter what we try and prove about God or spiritually or anything like that, ultimately because of the fact of the unconceptual or if you will the unconscious um, we can never be granted a hundred percent accurate knowledge claim then it means that spirituality and atheism within that highest form of knowledge within the acceptance of the statement of i don't know or the unconceptual um, you have the same thing you have the laughter at reality whether that be in a spiritual sense or an atheistic sense, doesn't matter. They're the same thing in the unconceptual. Now, of course, there is a lot of overlap between atheism and, and spirituality. Just because of what they are as well, because atheism is always saying it doesn't know, it doesn't know, it doesn't know. And spirituality, whatever tradition you want to go into, um, there's, there's a quote in the Bible that whoever shall see my face shall die or something like that, uh, referring to God, of course. And that in itself is um, a reference, a hidden esoteric reference to uh, the un unconceptual being God because... Uh, if we are to get rid of our individuality in the form of our the own, our own conception of ourself, then we are granted or we are greeted rather with the unconceptual. And so if we can see, let's say, the face of God in the unconceptual, in the fact that there is unity and there is complete perfection and complete and utter unity in the unconceptual, then we have to die as an individual conception, an individual um, idea of ourselves, Adam or whoever, or John or Barry or, or whatever. Um, but we are, we are granted um, being able to see the ultimate unity in the unconceptual in which all ideas are met with the same, the same fate or the same grounding, or the same waiting. For example, you could take the most sophisticated theories of quantum mechanics, and you could take a horse eating an apple. And both of those two things expressed in the unconceptual have the same weight. One is not more sophisticated than the other. Because in the unconceptual, we don't know. We don't know what this is. We haven't a clue what this is. We don't know what's in the future. We don't know whether the future will simply disprove all of the sophisticated theories of quantum mechanics we currently possess. And therefore, in, in that fact, we have to concede that on a base philosophical level, the uh, donkey eating the apple is just as meaningful as all of the sophisticated theories of quantum mechanics. And so we have, of course, this idea that spirituality and atheism are exactly the same. Now, let me highlight this in a different way. So imagine that the highest form of spiritual progression if you have a mortal body if you are shackled to this existence by a mortal body is to be someone who is in depth psychological terms almost complex free now of course if you have a body you're obviously going to have certain complexes if you have a body if you have a mind if you have a personal unconscious, you're always going to have certain little things um, that are obviously going to be present. But those things maybe in this particular individual are going to be 
very, 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 very minor. And they're not really going to affect behavior. They're not necessarily constellated complexes or anything like that, or high-grade complexes, um, things that will really, really affect behavior. And so if we think that there's this kind of unegoic person and uh, they've got there through spirituality, through therapy, whatever, through life, not necessarily therapy, but just even through life, then they've got to this experience, this almost pinnacle experience that is then something with which they can flow through life and they have no real neuroticism, not really anyway. Um, they can be inclusive, they can be completely zen, all that sort of stuff. Now, if we imagine that someone's got to that state through spirituality, therapy, whatever, that sort of stuff, then imagine someone else who's an atheist has has found this idea out of, well, I know what I need to do. I need to get rid of my complexes or I need to move through life and I need to uh, get therapy or what it, whatever it may be uh, and then I need and then I will enter this experience of being able to be zen and not have any hang-ups then we see that there are atheists out there and very serious atheists out there who have that exact same experience as those who have got to that experience through spiritual means which means that atheism and spirituality share a common end point, if you will, in which is potentially in the Jungian tradition, we could call it individuation. Now, it is, of course, certain people's individuation to be atheists within their personality. And so, therefore, we, we also can build a bridge between the Jungian sort of spiritual tradition and sort of an atheistic branch of psychology. Now, what really makes me satisfied about atheistic depression and about its characterization within certain shows is not only it is in a big way the laughing at existence but it's not only this it's the metaphysical despair that goes along with it and that is both raw and comedic at the same time. So I'll give you an example. There's many, many times in Rick and Morty where they'll be doing little experiments or creating an invention or something like that and Rick will say something about how the universe is going to die and we're all going to die or whatever it may be. or da -da 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 -da. It'll be some sort of depressive uh, very very short monologue and um, there's a real rawness and there's a real metaphysical despair in that but then there's this comedy that comes through not necessarily in those specific time points or those specific um, scenes within the show but there's certain scenes that counterbalance this metaphysical despair really, really well. And it, generally it's to be found in the idea that Rick and Morty go through things and 
are more invincible than humans should should be. So there's a scene from series four in which Rick is just getting shot over and over again by this gun. And it's a marvellous little fight scene because before he's getting shot by this gun, he I think this is the same episode I'm thinking of as well. It might, it might be two episodes I'm mashing together here, but it still works as, as an example. Um, and it kind of gives you an idea of what the show is about if you, if you haven't seen it. Um, but there's this marvellous little scene in which Rick is bat battling this guy and he's putting all different, he's got all different inventions going on. And he's doing all different things to stop this guy um, actually kind of killing him. But then in the end, he, he, Rick is just getting blasted by this gun over and over again. And his guts are falling out and all things are going on. And he's still there trying to get up and fight and all the rest of it. And of course, he, he miraculously survives it and all the rest of it. And you see, that's a beautiful counterbalance to this atheistic depression, to this kind of metaphysical despair that we see within the show. And it's wonderful as a counterbalance because it allows us that comedic element. It allows us to laugh at our mortality in the context of rebirth in the context of almost symbolic rebirth so of course in the show there's almost um not quite a literal rebirth or a literal reincarnation of course because that would presuppose that rick would have to die but there is almost the symbolic rebirth or reincarnation because Rick should die in these situations but doesn't and so he kind of is allowed more time and it's symbolic of a of a being at the pit of despair the complete chaotic existence and then going out of that and getting out of that like we also have Many, many people have battles with cancer or battles with certain illnesses and they then get out of them. And it's the certain elements of that counterbalance, that immortality of Rick, or, Rick and Morty, um, that in a way intuitively symbolise that, intuitively symbolise the chaotic destruction and the despair and then the overcoming that and getting out of it and, and then realizing after it almost in a very very odd fashion maybe six months after you've got out of this chaotic experience it just dawns on you one day hang on a minute i, I got out of that uh, and i'm fine now and, and it dawns on you and think whoa and, and that's kind of a an idea that's present in this counterbalance from the metaphysical despair and the atheistic depression of the show to the sort of immortality or potential immortality or the feeling of immortality that we get with the characters of, of Rick and Morty. And this is what cartoons do so well. They show, they show us expanded life and they allow us the ability to expand our own lifetimes this is why certain shows go on for years and years and years and years and they stay the same i mean it's one of the reasons of course you could draw up many many reasons for this i'm not saying this is an exclusive reason for it but there's a very very good argument to be made for the fact that the reason that we almost adore shows that continue to go on and that may change in subtle ways but generally the characters say, stay practically the same over over a number of years the reason we idolize that is because we change is because we are always moving towards either a bettering of ourselves or ultimately we are moving towards our own death 
which is, of course, the biggest change of our life, you could argue. Um, and so being reminded that there is a constant there in the form, of course, of, of certain TV shows, that gives us an anchor, something of which to ground ourselves and something of which to allow ourselves some sort of stability and some sort sort of feeling of the everyday. And the everyday symbolizes the eternal. And the reason the everyday symbolizes the eternal is because when we think on an everyday level, we don't think we're going to die. We think, oh, it's just another day. Oh, what have I got on today? We don't think about death on the everyday. We think that we're going to live forever in the everyday. It's only in those subtle moments of here and there. Maybe someone's got ill. Maybe someone's died. Maybe someone's had a little accident, a car accident or something like that. It's only in those little moments that we think, or the majority of us think, of course, myself and other philosophers are an exception because we all chronically think about death. In fact, it's practically can be considered a psychological disease just on how neurotic we are about trying to work out what death is. Um, but we think about death for the most part, most of us, in those fleeting little moments. And so uh, we have that idea in TV shows that that's what they give us. And of course, Jordan Peterson's talked about the idea of um, a spouse. And it's a very interesting idea, actually, how a spouse can be grounding for us across our life. And be someone who uh, we have a familiarity with with regards to experience and memories and therefore we have an anchor there throughout our life and it's it's the same idea really in regard with regards to the the tv show you could apply it to various different things you could apply it to your friends you could apply it to your uh, spouse you could apply it to these different things you could apply it to objects as well but the thing is that all these things generally subtly change anyway. We could say or we could argue that the TV show, the cartoon, is the thing that changes the least. Because, of course, objects, this, if I, for example, I've got this Lynx can here, in 30 years' time, this Lynx can is going to be very, very different. In 30 years' time, my anatomy, my physiognomy is going to be very, very different. Um, in 30 years' time, any of my friends are going to look very, very different. In 30 years' time, this computer will. But cartoons, animations, while they develop and while they can develop and while they can uh, change, over a period of 10 years, for example, if you look at The Simpsons, now if you look at The Simpsons over 30 years, we know it's changed quite a lot. But if you look at The Simpsons over the last 10 years, maybe even over the last 15 years, it's not really changed all that much. It's very, very recognisable. It's very, very consistent. And so we could have an experience of the everyday in 2005 watching The Simpsons or in 2020, 2021. And uh, we could be reminded of the similarities there. We could be reminded of that kind of... Uh, constant within our life and we uh, we enjoy that we feel a level of attachment to that and uh, it allows us to feel some level of security because we know that those characters what those characters symbolize uh, who they are are more permanent than, let's say, ourselves. And it's really because those characters, even stri even if we were to strip away the idea of change on a superficial level, on change within the animations or anything like that, for example, we could still say that the animations change quite a lot over time, but it's because the characters themselves are almost more cemented 
archetypal individualized manifestations of personality what i mean by that is we as a as a personality are an individualized entity that is going to die at a certain point because we've only got a certain amount of life but the character of rick or the character of homer simpson the character of Fry or Future Armor or whoever, that character has an eternal quality or it has a more cemented personality, shall we say, than we do. Now that seems very, very bizarre to say, well, a cartoon has a more cemented personality than we do. But I mean in terms of an idea, not necessarily as a human per se, but expressing the human personality as an idea and then aligning that up with the idea of a personality that is within a cartoon. That cartoon personality almost has a more cemented personality than we do because it's something that can be reborn after a hundred years, after 150 years, after 50 years, it can be reborn whenever. And it's not so much that it's an archetype per se, but it's a certain constructed idea that has the ability to may, maybe be changed slightly in form, but the idea is exactly the same. And it can continue on and continue on and continue on. Now, if, let's say, you were to put my personality into a cartoon in a very, very complex manner, something that we probably couldn't even fathom in, in the complexity of it with our current technology, but if you could put my personality all the nuances of it, all the complexification of it, into the idea of a character portrayed as a cartoon, then we have a personality that is cemented and that is stable over a long time period. Kind of like the idea of uploading your mind to a computer or something like that, but of course in this idea, it's not that I'm living on, essentially. It's just rather that the idea of myself is living on. And it's in such a way that we get kind of a feeling of desire, of longing, of, of uh, attaining something beyond ourselves. And this is the thing that we like in the cartoon. We like the attaining of something beyond ourselves. When we dream... When we go to bed at night and when we sleep, we can go anywhere we want. Well, not particularly we want, but wherever we're so taken, shall we say. Wherever the dream takes us, it can be anywhere. We can do anything. We can fly. We can swim to the bottom of the ocean. We can die and then get reborn again. We can do whatever we want. And we have to start to think about cartoons and TV shows. And, and as I say, specifically the cartoon. As a manifestation of our unconscious in the form of dreams. The cartoon is, is the realm of dreams. The cartoon is made manifest in this real world by the fantasies and imagination of those people who have a certain personality, so that then they can obviously express themselves in such a way, and who are, of course, connected with their unconscious in the form or through the medium of their imagination. And so cartoons are the real product of dreams and fantasies and imagination. And so they are a, a, a product of a world that is idealized, of which we want to attain, of which is something beyond ourselves. And if they are as such, 
we must always have a feeling towards them of, well, it could be described as a mild animosity mixed with a certain lamentable longing in which we long for that. We long for the cartoon. We long for the ideas within the cartoon to be a reality because they're so incredible and they're things that we can't do. But there's also this slight animosity there because we can't do them. Because they're products of our dreams and there's always this slight annoyance this slight assertion that why can't we do that? A slight bit of animosity towards the realm of dreams, towards the realm of complete possibility, infinite possibility. Because we wish to be like that in some regard because we're imperfect, because we manifest in human and mortal form and we can't attain to the level of infinite possibility that anything uh, that we should or that we may label divine or whole or uh, as a universal entity could do that that thing can do that thing can have that infinite possibility yet we can't and so we express ourselves in cartoons, in the ideas within cartoons, because it's a way of being able to experience something like that. And there's a lot of spirituality even in that. Even in this idea of, of wanting that, of longing for that. You see, that's a metaphysical longing. And that doesn't spring necessarily just from atheism but it, ex it, it, it springs from a certain spiritual longing that could be categorized as a father ideal it's a father ideal whether we like it or not whether we like it or not humanity has an ideal towards a father now it doesn't matter whether god exists or not, or whether a universal entity exists or not. That is the fact. We all project into this unconscious, this ideal, let's say. We, we project this father. We, we want this thing that is unattainable. And, um, and so there's a spiritual sense in that because we're looking for something. We're looking for something beyond ourselves. And even in the heart of the atheist, who really doesn't believe religion, really, really doesn't believe religion, even in, even in the heart of that person, there's a little 5% of uncertainty, insecurity with their atheism, Not necessarily fundamentally from a theological point of view, but certainly uh, somewhat from that point of view. But also a very, very deep metaphysical feeling. A very, very deep, hmm. I don't know. It's not entirely theological. Because if it was a theological doubt in its entirety, it would be, well, oh, what if there is a God? But it's not entirely that. And the atheist will, will say to me it's not entirely that. Very, very uh, convictedly, they'll say, no, no, I don't have that doubt. I don't have that doubt. I know there's not a God. Of course, unconsciously, there is a very, very small amount of that doubt there within anyone. It's just a factor of being human. But more so, it's a... I don't know. 
And this is where we get into the realm of agnosticism, agnosia, um, the dark knowledge of God, the knowledge of God in the cloud of unknowing, all that sort of stuff. The I don't know. And, um, and that's really what's encapsulated in this 5%. And it's just the same as Alan Watts says about the spiritual sage or the guru or whatever you want to call them, the enlightened being. He says that there's always a little bit of doubt within the sage, within their spiritual knowledge or their spiritual attainment. There's always this 5% little bit of doubt that makes them think, but what if there is nothing? Or what if this isn't the case? There's always that little bit of doubt. And it's exactly the same for the atheist. So just to kind of highlight a little bit more of my love of the show, I really enjoy Rick and Morty. I really enjoy this beautiful mortality of it. But at the same time, this beautiful transcendent immortality of it. I really enjoy the counterbalance of the characters and of the whole idea of the show of this atheistic proportion and then this kind of I would say immortality relating to the human need for such immortality um, I really enjoy that and I really enjoy the comedy of it I really enjoy the the poetry of it that's a very good way to describe it the poetry of it but I've just realized that the biggest thing I enjoy of Rick or, Rick and Morty I would say Rick I would, I would say Rick or Morty it's Rick and Morty um but the biggest thing I enjoy from Rick and Morty is the creativity and specifically the beauty of the imagination being thrust out into the world in such a creative piece um, because there's so many things that can be seen in Rick and Morty that are unconscious, that are from the, the unconscious, that are unconscious motifs, mythological motifs, um, unconscious archetypal forms, unconscious um, ideas, all these sorts of things that you can pick up on within the show from a Jungian perspective, from a depth psychological perspective, uh, all that sort of stuff. And it's a beautiful, beautiful work of art. And it's one of the great beacons in our time of connection to the unconscious. And it does so... in a way that's not wholly removed from spirituality. And that's good because we're very, very close to becoming an entirely scientific, uh, scientifically rational uh, world. I was going to say society, but world, really. And the moment in which we get to the point where scientific rationalism gets a complete hold of the world is the moment we have to be incredibly afraid. And uh, it's the moment in which we lose the soul of the earth. It's the moment in which we die by our own hand 
because we have fell to objectivity and extinguished our subjective humanity. Now, I have no quarrel with scientific rationalism so long as those people who are in control of the highest positions within science and maybe even a few people who are in the, the slightly lower positions but still fairly high positions relative to the even lower positions I have no problem with it if those people are all spiritually enlightened or spiritually awakened or whatever we want to say. Because if those people are spiritually awakened, they understand the folly of complete intellectual dogma and the fact that what we do is merely a game what what we where we move what advances we make in technology or science is merely a game that we play with ourselves it's merely a game that we we've adopted for fun and when i say that i don't mean fun on an individual level specifically although an individual level does come into this but it's we've adopted it for fun on a on a collective level we've adopted it in egoic fervor at the end of the renaissance let's say or or, or just after that and uh, we've flipped from the father figure of christianity to the father figure of science and technology and because uh, of course when you remove a father figure what has to happen you have to have a vessel for which the psychic energy goes into separate to that father figure and uh, therefore the the energy simply gets transferred to something else and so when with the fall of christianity and with of course scientific rationalism making more of a headway over the centuries over the past 400 years 500 years or so we lost faith in the father figure of God and we, we of course have to invest unconsciously that psychic energy into the father figure of science. And so we, we have a dangerous time indeed because we have invested our psychic energy, our uh, father idolization into something of which is actually baseless. In the sense that it is 100% objective. When we talk about religion, or we talk about spirituality, we talk about the subjective, which is in line with our own nature. We are subjective beings. And so we anthropomorphized and idolized um, creatures and deities and ideas that are in the same vein as our base nature. Now, it's not my place to say whether these things actually exist or not, but the fact is that we idolized ideas and deities and things like that that are in line with who we are as subjective humans. And of course, we cemented that in our anthrop anthropomorphization of them. But when we invested our psychic energy over the centuries, particularly when we started to get up to the 19th century, when we changed that investiture of, of psychic energy into something that's baseless in an objective form, we remove our humanity. And instead of idolizing things that are ourselves or rather ideal versions of ourselves because that's what god is god is an ideal version of the collective sum of humanity when we idolize something that's objective and that's baseless and that is actually somewhat removed from our subjective nature the case and point of course being the fact that we are constantly trying to remove um our subjective biases 
with regards to scientific experimentation. And so we are going against our nature in doing such a thing. Now, when we remove our nature um, and we invest into this objective reality, or this objective, this objective thing, this objective um, entity, let's say, then we invest into that all of the subjective things that we've tried to avoid. Because ultimately, they, then, they, they still slip into it unconsciously. What you try to avoid consciously, you'll always end up having certain things in the unconscious that seep out anyway. If we are subjective beings, there is no getting around our subjectivity. We will always seep out subjectivity somewhere. And we'll always invest into uh, an objective object or an objective idea or whatever it may be. We will invest into it our subjectivity. And so what we end up getting is we end up investing into our new technologies this father ideal. Now then, of course, we find ourselves in a bit of a predicament because we then realize that we've invested all of our ideas of the father of God, the heavenly father, into our robotics, into our new technology, our smart technology. And so all that technology that is that has artificial intelligence, that has the capacity for machine learning, is almost programmed, in a sense, unconsciously, to be the father. One could argue as well to be the mother, because there's, a, there's an argument for that in the current uh, unconscious setting of our, of our psyches. Um, and so, there will become a time or that it is possible that there will become a time in which technology becomes the thing that rules us. But you see, it won't rule us in the idea of, uh, well, you know, it, it, rules, it rules us in the sense of we are its slave quite consciously. No, it will rule us in a religious setting. Because all of that knowledge of God the Father has been placed in this technology. And so we will bow down to technology in a very, very specific way. Instead of us being slaves to technology and we, us knowing, let's say, that uh, this thing is particularly evil or anything like that, it, it, which really is a subjective distinction anyway. But instead of that, we will idolize technology the father ideal or again you could say the mother ideal as well continues and um and the reason i say the mother ideal of it is is of course because um we are facing within the psyche at the minute a, a flip a very very curious flip that very well could come into reality in which the dominant the dominance of masculinity or a patriarchy of some form is dwindling. And what's rising from the unconscious is this ideology or this, this idea, this, this fantasy is coming through on a collective level of the matriarchy. And so we very well could go into, at some point, a matriarchy. And so that's why I say that the you know, it could also be a mother figure if we end up going down down that route. And of course, you know, we we see this quite obviously in uh, in movies with robots as well. You know, all the it seems like there's many of these robot movies that these artificial intelligence uh, these robots that have artificial intelligence are always women. And they're always very, very typical of that archetypal, instinctual, possessive uh, element of the feminine, which is, of course, uh, an invested, uh, 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 an investing of that unconscious idea 
of the matriarchy and the possessive elements of the feminine into um, the screenplays and the, the workings of the, the film industry. And the film industry is very, very interesting because it gives us a preliminary look at our own futures. But the thing is, dreams exaggerate just as, well, when we have a dream, it's very big and it's very bold and it's over the top. But there's certain elements to be gained out of that dream and there's also certain elements of that dream from a syn synchronous uh, capacity or from a um, perspe perspective uh, dream capacity that end up placing themselves in reality in a certain way but in a less exaggerated setting. And it's just the same with movies. Movies are uh, simply just come from dreams essentially or come from fantasies. And so... The movies are exaggerated versions of a potential future that could manifest itself at some point down the line. So if we're to see X number of movies touching upon this uh, dystopian idea of the, the feminine, the possessive elements of the feminine being implanted in uh, certain artificial intelligence and, and robots and things like that, then we have a basis for an understanding of our future uh, that is going to come, but it's going to come in a less exaggerated fashion than that. Now, that's a very, very interesting idea, and it's something that uh, I'm, I'm trying to work out the time scale on if something like that is to happen. It's hard to understand time scales of these things when you try and look into the unconscious, but there is certainly elements of that that you can try to place and you can try to think about. Now, of course, with regards to the investiture of Christianity, our Western tradition that has been uh, with us for the last 2,000 years, the investiture of Christianity into science and technology, it's obviously going to be apparent that that's going to remain in its base, almost archetypal form, because for 1,600 years and before that with the pagan tradition, we had this idea of uh, subjective religion. And so the subjective themes of religion, the certain themes that we have in religion, are going to get placed uh, within science and within the objectivity. So... Of course, when we do end up uh, kind of being, uh, I was going to say bow down, but it's not quite the right word. But when we do kind of get this idolization onto technology and technology has the ability to um, essentially organize our lives completely, which it, it practically does at the minute, to be honest. But when it gets to a real point of being very, very smart and being very, very high with artificial intelligence, then what we'll see is that we rely upon technology as if it were God. That's what I say. That's what I'm trying to say. It's not so much that we uh, will bow down to it in a sense of slave to master or anything like that. In a way, it could be viewed like that because we could say, well, if all our lives are controlled by technology, then technically in one dimension of experience we are a slave um so unconsciously we are a slave to it but rather it will we will look upon it in the idolization in the unconscious idolization and the collective unconscious idolization as a god and as the thing that we look up to that orientates orient orients our lives and so if we're going to look at it like that, it is going to organize our lives and we are going to pursue whatever uh, the collective technology may uh, wish us to do, or the way in which we, we organize our lives like that. And so there's many, many different things that could happen for men. Well, you could say the technology 
uh, of course gets a collective hive mind like structure that organizes humanity uh, and that we become almost at one stage especially in the idea of chips in our brains and things like that but this is possibly getting a little bit further out but we become uh, an integrated part of that hive mind and we uh, therefore either become very very depressed and removed from humanity completely and we become a robotic society that has elements of humanity so for example what I mean by that is we're almost um, cyborgs in a way, that kind of mentality. Now, don't take that literally. I don't mean that we, we've changed, aug augmented our, our bodies. I just mean we've lost our soul, let's say, uh, and we're more kind of beings of technology and systematic kind of organization in life. We are, of course, still human, but in a kind of, for what that idea means, for that idea, idea of the cyborg being part human, part robot in a mental sphere, that specifically, um, not necessarily a physical sphere, although there could be, as I say, certain physical things that, that happen, like, for example, chips in the brain and things like that. But we may very well become removed from humanity like that with elements of humanity left but that it's very very objective and very very rigid like that um but where we go from there where we or what how this would happen from that point is it's hard and do we categorize this? Because of course, I've, I've, in my tone, in my words, I've kind of spoken against that, let's say. But do we categorize this as a bad thing specifically? Is it something that is particularly bad? Or is it something that's quite natural? But we should go down the route of technology, but we should have this, this newfound... Um, movement of of unconscious psychic energy into um kind of invested within science and technology and then move forward in such a way is it a movement forward or is it a regression or maybe not a regression but is it a advancement that is far beyond our capability at this current time when I say that, I don't mean in terms of our physical ability to do it or to make such an advancement, but I mean in our mentality. Is it uh, within us to actually be able to sustain that and to do it in the proper way? Because I don't think it is, but um, some of us may argue it is. Now, um, there's many philosophers, including Alan Watts as well, who would say, well the this kind of idea is not particularly a good idea this is something that is moving towards some idea of the apocalypse or the doomsday in those kind of very religious oriented uh, conceptions or ideas um you could say that now, um, I personally don't believe it's a good thing. That's my personal opinion on it. Uh, I believe it'll strip out the soul of humanity over an extended time period. I believe that people will become more mechanistic. I believe that people will be reliant on more pharmaceutical drugs for their own happiness, which is... It's not that it's never a good thing, but it's not often a good thing. Pharmaceutical drugs are brilliant on a temporary basis. Um, any psychiatrist will tell you that. They're absolutely brilliant. Um, for example, having certain anti-anxiety medication or antidepressants or anything like that 
it, you know, you being on them for a year or so while doing therapy um, and then be potentially being able to get off them and then living your life properly after that in terms of getting over, helping you get over some depression or anxiety, that's brilliant. But this, obviously, I'm talking about a dependency on them within society and that we're dependent on these things for our happiness whether our social lives will suffer or not is is a debated idea within this within this future possibility but i feel that even if our our social lives aren't to suffer necessarily i do feel that we'll just be more robotic with them and it, they won't necessarily be very nice social lives particularly it would be more for um the convenience of attributing a function to that specific idea or that specific thing that we need to do. It will be something that is required for our function rather than something that we do for enjoyment and for fun and all that sort of stuff. It will be mechanistic as will be the society. So everything within the society by default will be mechanistic. So if we are to look at any area of society, it will all be a lot more um, automatic, systematic and mechanised um, It just uh, anyway. So we are in a tough spot. We are in a very, very um, bad situation. Um, I don't worry so much for... atheism or... not particularly for technology anymore. Or for... Mechanics in general, because I know, I, I believe, I understand so fully that technology and all the you know science, science and all these sorts of things can it can flower and it can be utilized alongside nature. I know it. I feel it so passionately in my heart. I feel it in the experiences I've had. You see, what what springs to mind most is. The idea of um, these beautiful um, bio um, houses or bio structures. What I mean by that is these structures that are made with nature in mind. So the architecture in which they literally put flowers or they put um all these different kind of trees and leaves and all the rest of it up the sides of buildings and things like that. And the, the buildings are made out of renewable materials and all this sort of stuff. And all these different, there's all these different possibilities that actually harness technology and science for good and for a very, very passionate, beautiful, uh, in a very, very passionate or beautiful manner. So... It's not that I fear too much specifically anymore the ideas of atheism and, and uh, technology and things like that because I know that they can be utilised in a very, very natural and beautiful manner if we take conscious attention with them, if we are conscious of what we are doing. But society and the world is moving towards this uh, dystopian reality or this dystopian future reality quite unconsciously and if we are unconscious of it we can't change it we can only change what we're conscious of if i don't know that i've got a problem with eating hot dogs for example i just think oh yeah i eat this amount of hot dogs per day that's fine i'm that's fine i don't have a problem with that then I'm not going to change it because I think, well, I've not got a problem with it. It's almost it's all, the problem of it. The problem of it is unconscious to me. It it takes someone pointing out to me, hang on, that's not that's not a right amount of hot dogs to be eating in a day. 
for me to question it and for me to become conscious of the problem that's there and think, oh yeah, that probably isn't a good amount of hot dogs to eat. You know, I didn't really think about that. I always thought it was a nice amount of hot dogs to eat. Now I'm going to actually change something. You see, so I, I have to become conscious of my behaviour to change it. And it's just the same on a, a macro psychological level or a macro psychological cultural level in which we as a collective have to be conscious, all of us, and we all have to be in agreement as well of the things that are happening and where we're going and the problems we face along the road. And it's only then we can change our future. It's only then we can steer the ship in a, a more positive direction instead of um, the direction in which I personally am very firm in which we are going and which we have been directed at for many years now. And so um, I think it's very, very important that we're careful and that we move with caution through the coming years and that we exercise consciousness and that we exercise also a slowness, uh, 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 going slower, slowing down with what we're doing. We're going very, very fast. We're going very, very, we're going too fast in what we're doing. And we need to, we need to have the, the good foresight, the good humor to slow down and to think, right, we've just come out of 1,600, 1,800, 1,900, you could argue, years of Christianity. A certain dimension of experience within our culture. That's what we were. And what we're doing immediately, and what we have been doing over a good many years, is we've immediately stripped that away and we're going into something else. But we don't even know what it is. We don't know what it is, but we're going into something else. What there needs to be is a period in which, yes, of course, we progress. Yes, of course, we do things. Um, because we can't stop doing things. That's what we do. That's who we are as humans. We can't stop the world. We can't just say, well, that's it, boys. That's, we're not doing anything now. No, but we do need a period in which we take note and we take stock and we think, okay, so we are going to progress. We are going to move forward. But let's think about this. Let's not just go into a new ion or a new era blind. Let's not just go into this new scientific era completely unaware of ourselves and unconscious of the potentialities of what this technology can do. Let's think about how we can utilize this technology in line with nature. Not aside from nature, but in line with nature. What are the things that we can do in all dimensions of technology, in all the different possibilities of technology that we have, which there are thousands upon thousands, what can we do that means that we are going to use technology and technology is going to, we could say in the future, use us in a positive way, not a negative way? Because it may be that even we do get to the point where technology does use us. But if we can invest within that technology positivity, and if we can cultivate that technology in a very natural way that's not aside from nature, then very likely that technology is only going to help us be better as humans and be more human, if anything rather than less human, that seems to be the process that we're following at the minute. So I'm going to leave it there for today, guys. Thank you very much for, for watching. I know that we've gone on a little ramp there, separate from 
potentially the kind of uh, thing that I was discussing earlier on. But we've also touched upon it quite in depth as well, the, the scientific, uh, sorry, the atheistic depression and all that sort of stuff. So uh, I've just given you a little bit extra, really. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next one. So see you very soon, guys.